Deciding on a RAID setup can be difficult and confusing, especially if you don't know how RAID setups work. Fortunately, I've done all the research on the most common RAID setup so that you don't have to. And hopefully in this video, I can explain as easy as I can how each of those RAID setups work. So buckle up, Buttercup, because we're gonna get right into it. Oh, and we're gonna talk about this bad boy too, the Synology DS1019 Plus, baby. Oh yeah. B-roll. If you don't already know, RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. It's not backup, it's just a solution to provide redundant data in case one of your multiple hard drives fails. And the reason why it's not considered as true backup, because what if your RAID setup gets caught on fire, or gets demolished by an earthquake, or abducted by aliens? I don't know, it could happen. But we're not here to talk about aliens, we're here to talk about how RAID setups work. And so, without further ado, and as simply as I can, let me try to explain. In a RAID 0 setup, all available drives are striped together or combined together so that it functions as one super hard drive, so to speak. For example, if you have a four bay NAS or RAID with hard drives at one terabyte each, that means you have four terabytes of usable storage. They are striped together because they love each other. And in this configuration, all data is distributed all across the drives, resulting in fast performance. The downside is that if one of those hard drives fails, then you lose everything because all those drives are striped together. Great for speed, but I do not recommend this RAID setup at all. In a RAID 1 setup, data is written identically on two sets of drives. So in a four bay NAS or RAID with hard drives at one terabyte each, that means you have two terabytes of usable storage with the other two terabytes set to write redundant data. So if one of the hard drives fails, you can rebuild that failed hard drive because your data was made redundant on the other set of drives. This is called mirroring because you are mirroring data onto another drive or another set of drives. It's slower than RAID 0, but still relatively fast data transfer with redundancy. This is a very common RAID configuration, but still one that I do not recommend. RAIDs 2, 3, and 4 aren't commonly used, and so we're just gonna skip all that, but I am gonna explain how RAID 4 works so that you can understand how RAID 5 and 6 work. I know, confusing, but just, just go with me. In a RAID 4 setup, one drive is used for parity, which is a technique that checks if data has been lost or written over when moved from one drive to another. In other words, if a hard drive fails, you have that one parity drive to rebuild your lost data. So for example, if you have four one terabyte hard drives, that means you have three terabytes of usable storage, while that one hard drive is used for parity. This is great because you have a larger capacity of storage, but the downside to this setup is a slow performance due to the parity written onto that one hard drive. Hard drive. There's a bottleneck that slows down performance, but that is actually fixed in a RAID 5 setup. RAID 5 is exactly the same as RAID 4, but instead of the parity information written onto one single hard drive, the parity information is now spread across all the drives. So if one hard drive fails, you can easily rebuild that data because the parity information is spread across all the drives. This setup works so well that it's actually replaced RAIDs 3 and 4 because it's not relying on a single disk for parity. The only downfall to RAID 5 is that it only supports one hard drive failure. If in the rare event that two hard drives fail at the same time, you're gonna need a RAID 6 setup. RAID 6 is exactly the same as RAID 5, but instead of one block of parity information written across all drives, there are two blocks of parity information spread across all the drives, just in case two hard drives fail at the same time. Again, it's rare that that could happen, but if you don't like taking risks and you have the storage capacity, then RAID 6 might be a good setup for you. It's not as fast as RAID 5 because of that double parity, but at least it provides security. And lastly, with the RAID 10 setup, you get the ultimate protection because it's basically combining RAID 0 and RAID 1, where you get the fast performance of RAID 0 and the redundancy of RAID 1. Basically, you have two sets of mirror drives, which are then combined to function as RAID 0. So for example, if a hard drive fails in one of those mirrored sets, the mirrored image preserves the data from that failed disk. No harm, no foul. Basically, RAID 10 is secure because of the mirroring duplicates of all your data. And it's fast because that data is striped all across multiple disks. The downside to this configuration is that it can be pretty expensive because you might need to get a lot of hard drives with large storage capacities in order for this solution to actually work. So out of all those RAID setups, which one is my personal favorite? Well, I absolutely love using RAID 5. 
I love having the large storage capacity, knowing that if one of my hard drives fails, at least I know I can rebuild that data. I'm not so worried about two hard drives failing at the same time, because like I've said before, it's pretty rare that that happens. Speed and capacity are very important to me, especially as a filmmaker and photographer, which is why I think RAID 5 is the perfect setup for my workflow. Now, if you want to have a RAID setup, you either need a DAS, which is a direct attached storage unit, or a NAS, a network attached storage unit. With a DAS, you can connect it directly to your computer, which is great, but I personally like using a NAS because I can connect it to my home network and access my files there. The great advantage to that is that I can access those files anywhere around the world as long as I have internet access. So if I'm traveling somewhere working on a project, I can actually pull files from my home network to wherever I am around the world, which is why I like using a NAS. And there are actually a couple of times where I needed to do that, and so that's why I like using a NAS. And the NAS that I recommend is the Synology DS1019+. Plus. This NAS is a great option for all filmmakers and photographers who want to store and archive their projects. There are five bays in the Synology DS1019+, Plus where I've installed five 14 terabyte Seagate Ironwolf NAS drives. That's a lot of terabytes. And since I've chosen a RAID 5 setup, I have a total storage capacity of 56 whopping terabytes. Plenty to store and archive years of video and photo projects. You don't have to get these specific hard drives if you don't want to, there are plenty other options, but Synology offers a RAID calculator that you can use to help you decide what size hard drive that you're going to need for your RAID setup of choice. On the DS1019 Plus, you get two gigabit ethernet ports, one eSATA port, and two USB type A ports, one on the back and one in the front. Inside the NAS is a 1.5 GHz Intel Celeron quad-core processor and 8 GB of RAM. You can also install up to two NVMe SSD slots for caching. In other words, caching allows you to dump your files first to the SSD, and once that fills up, all those files can be then transferred to the hard drives. It's a great solution if you want faster data transfers. One of my favorite features of the DS1019 Plus is the USB copy feature to back up your files onto your NAS directly from your camera, if it's compatible, or from one of your portable drives if you're shooting somewhere on location. So that's handy. Oh, and friendly reminder, a NAS is not a true backup solution. It's just a more secure way to store and archive your files. If you really wanna have a true backup solution, then you gotta back up those files somewhere offsite, whether online or somewhere else. For me, I actually have additional cold storage where I archive all my past projects onto separate external drives that I then place in a fireproof case. It's probably not the most efficient way to back up and archive my projects, but hey, it works for me. But if you do want to back up all your files from your RAID setup to an online backup platform like Google Drive or Backblaze, then the DS1019 Plus has a solution for that, and it's a feature called CloudSync. And if you don't want to back up all your files from your RAID setup to an online cloud service, then you can get an additional NAS and place it somewhere off-site or to another location, and then use a feature called Hyper Backup and copy those files on your first NAS onto your second NAS. And that way you can avoid paying a subscription fee to an online backup service. It's kind of like you're making your own backup cloud service, so I guess that's cool. Maybe save some money. Maybe not. I don't know. Overall, the DS1019 Plus is super easy to use, works great for Mac and PC. They have incredible customer service if you have any questions, and designed for all creatives that want a secure place to store and archive their projects. Huge thanks to Synology for sending over the DS1019 Plus for me to play with. It's been awesome. I absolutely love it. And if you want to check it out for yourself, then link will be in the description below. Well, hopefully this was an easy explanation of how those RAID setups work. Confusing at first, I know, but uh, hopefully this uh, helps you out. And of course, if you have any questions at all regarding this specific NAS or just raids in general, or if you just want to say hi, then by all means, leave a comment down below. But I'm out of here, folks. Off to make it another video, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!